On the very day of September 11, several commentators drew a parallel with the historical events of Pearl Harbor. And it's a day that will, as was the case with Pearl Harbor, live in infamy in American history. The last time there was an attack like this on the United States was Pearl Harbor. Reminiscent of another terrible day, the attack on Pearl Harbor. But there was also someone on the same day who offered a prediction. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, guess what we did? We went back and found out that yes, the evidence was there. We should have known. And again, I think what we're going to see, even in this instance, this Pearl Harbor of the 21st century is very much the same kind of thing. In fact, the more information that has been emerging about September 11, the more we have come to realize that many different aspects of the two events bear a chilling resemblance to each other. While both events were needed by the U.S. to go to war, in both cases, the ultimate goal was not the one initially stated. Roosevelt knew a surprise Japanese attack would enrage the public and jumpstart the American war machine. In this way, FDR would get backdoor entry into what he really wanted, war with Hitler. According to their own documents, before 9-11, the neocons knew that a surprise attack like a new Pearl Harbor would enrage the public and jumpstart the war machine against Afghanistan. In this way, they would get a backdoor entry into what they really wanted, the war with Saddam Hussein. From the very beginning, there was a conviction uh, that Saddam Hussein was a bad person and that he needed to go. He says that going after Saddam Hussein was topic A 10 days after the inauguration, eight months before September 11th. Before and during the war, the propaganda machine made a relentless effort to create a direct connection between Hitler and Japan. One poll taken immediately after Pearl Harbor showed that more than 60% of Americans believed that Germany was behind the attack. The Bush-Cheney propaganda machine made an even harder effort to create a direct association between Iraq and Osama bin Laden. By the end of 2003, nearly 70% of Americans believed that Saddam was implicated in the September 11 attacks. Top levels of the Roosevelt administration knew in advance that Pearl Harbor was going to be attacked. General Marshall and Admiral Stark and indeed FDR indeed knew that Pearl Harbor was being painted for a bombing run by the Japanese. Secretary of State Cordell Hull even knew the exact day of the attack, a week before it took place. Cordell Hull was Secretary of State, and he called me on Saturday mornings, and he started to relate that Pearl Harbor would be attacked on December the 7th. Before September 11, many in the intelligence community knew the attacks were on their way. There was so much discussion about this attack. Everybody was talking about it. George Tenet had some meetings. Other, other analysts had meetings at the White House. Vital information on the Japanese attack was kept from those who could have used it to defend the Hawaiian port and to minimize the number of American casualties. Two men could use that information immediately. Admiral Husband Kimmel and Lieutenant General Walter Short, the commanders at Pearl Harbor. But they never get it. According to Hill, that was no mistake. If FDR and his administration deliberately withheld the vital intelligence from Pearl Harbor, and all the evidence indicates that they did, then it was certainly a deliberate conspiracy to set Pearl Harbor up for a total defeat. Before September 11, important information was kept from counterterrorism czar Richard Clark, who could have organized a defense and even have prevented the attacks altogether. You have to intentionally stop it. You have to intervene and say, no, I don't want that report to go. We therefore conclude that there was a high-level decision in the CIA ordering people not to share that information. In both cases, the pre-knowledge by the U.S. government on the upcoming attacks was denounced in front of Congress. In September 1944, Republican Representative Forrest Harness of Indiana made the first congressional charge about a Pearl Harbor conspiracy. He said that three days before Pearl Harbor, the Australian government had warned Washington that a Japanese aircraft carrier was headed towards Hawaii. But, he said, that information was withheld from Kimmel and Short. 
After September 11, Republican Congressman Kurt Weldon denounced the pre-knowledge of information on the upcoming attacks, which was intentionally withheld from the intelligence community. This is an attempt to prevent the American people from knowing the facts about how we could have prevented 9-11, and people are covering it up today. When honest officials stumbled on important information on the Japanese attack, they went straight to their superiors, only to see that information ignored, diverted, or suppressed altogether. The chief of naval intelligence in Washington, Captain Alan Kirk, recognized the message as plans for a bombing raid, but his persistent attempts to warn Kimmel ended when he was assigned to other duties. At Pearl Harbor, the admiral had no way of knowing that Kirk had been repeatedly refused permission to warn him. In August 2001, FBI agent Colleen Rowley discovered information that could have led to uncover the September 11 plot. But her memos never got past her superiors, while she was prevented from pursuing the investigation any further. Finally, it turns out they were not read by the lawyer and the FBI who had the duty to send those over to the Department of Justice. Hours before the Japanese strike, Roosevelt's chief of staff, George Marshall, became suddenly unavailable, delaying the process of communication within the chain of command. General George Marshall, the man who should have acted, was nowhere to be found. Colonel Rufus Bratton was responsible for keeping Marshall supplied with such vital information. For Bratton, Marshall's sudden unavailability at a time when America was on the brink of war could not have been accidental. In the crucial hours of September 11, Defense Secretary Rumsfeld and other top military became suddenly unavailable, hampering the decisional process within the chain of command. For 30 minutes, we couldn't find him. Withholding information, however, may not have been sufficient to guarantee the success of the Japanese attack. The military capacity of the Hawaiian port was also kept below its requirements. General Short, faced with the need to send out long-range patrols, had only a handful of suitable aircraft. His demands for more were not seen as a priority. On September 11, only four jets remained on alert to defend the entire sector of the country most likely to suffer an attack. I've determined, of course, that with only four aircraft, we cannot defend the whole northeastern United States. President Roosevelt gave direct orders not to interfere with the Japanese attack. President Roosevelt told the General Marshall to send a message to the Hawaiian and Philippine commanders, don't interfere with Japan's overt act of war. The United States desires that they, uh, Japan, commit the first overt act. There's no argument about what FDR meant. Uh, he meant that, uh, that the U.S. naval plan uh, to defend Pearl Harbor should not and cannot be executed. On September 11, Vice President Cheney gave a direct order regarding the plane headed towards Washington, which in fact resulted in the plane reaching its target without being shot down. The young man said, Mr. Vice President, if the plane's 10 miles out, um, do the orders still stand? And the vice president sort of whipped his head around and said, of course they do. It was thanks to the indignation for the 3,000 sailors killed at Pearl Harbor that President Roosevelt could finally enter a war the U.S. had been preparing for months in advance. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph so help us God. It was thanks to the indignation for the 3,000 victims of September 11 that President Bush could launch a war that had already been prepared in the smallest detail. CNN and Time Magazine have reported that on September 10, 2001, a military plan to attack Afghanistan had been placed on George Bush's desk to be signed by the President upon his return from Florida. May God grant us wisdom and may he watch over the United States of America. Then came the official commissions, which in both cases were tasked to find out whether there had been a conspiracy by the same authorities that were suspected of having participated in the conspiracy. Just three months after VJ Day, Senator Alvin Barkley of Kentucky convenes the Joint Congressional Committee on the investigation of the Pearl Harbor attack. The committee lays much of the blame on the commanders at Pearl Harbor and largely exonerates FDR and his top advisors. But its conclusions draw charges of cover-up and cronyism. 
gross negligence becomes high treason when the motive is discovered or understood. In July 2004, the commission published its final report. Two and a half million pages of documents. We've interviewed over 1,200 individuals, including experts and officials, past and present. However, the commission report failed to meet many of the family's expectations and concluded that 9-11 was merely a failure of imagination. Published in 2004, the 9-11 Commission Report has become the central focus of criticism by the 9-11 Truth Movement, a movement comprised of thousands of individuals and associations from all over the world, all connected through the Internet. The Commission's report is accused of having simply rubber-stamped the government's version of the events by ignoring all the evidence against it, while covering up its most conspicuous holes with a long series of omissions, distortions, and even plain falsehoods. Led by researcher David Ray Griffin, an international panel of 20 experts on 9-11 has compiled a list of the strongest evidence against the official version that has emerged to this day. This evidence is available to the public on their website in four different languages. Despite all the evidence that has emerged in the last decades, there are many who still reject the idea of a conspiracy at Pearl Harbor and prefer to reassert the much more simplistic explanation called the official version. There was no conspiracy. FDR did not know. Uh, Cordell Hull did not know. The American government did not know that the Japanese were going to attack Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. It was a what has uh, been called a failure of imagination. Despite all the evidence presented in the last 10 years by the 9-11 Truth Movement, there are many who openly support the official version by the government and dismiss such evidence as irrelevant. These people are known as debunkers, as their stated intent is to debunk the evidence presented by the 9-11 Truth Movement against the official version. The most authoritative debunker in Italy is Paolo Attivissimo, a member of an organization called CICAP, which has openly declared war on the so-called conspiracy theorists. Attivissimo has held numerous conferences on 9-11, in which he has covered all the most important aspects of the debate. The most prominent champion for the official version in France is Jerome Quirant, who also wrote a book called September 11 and the Conspiracy Theories. Quirant also participated in numerous conferences and television debates on 9-11 in his own country. But the flagship for the debunkers worldwide is certainly the American magazine Popular Mechanics. In 2006, they published a book called Debunking 9-11 Myths, in which the authors purport to have refuted all the major claims against the official version by the 9-11 Truth Movement. Jim Miggs is the editor of Popular Mechanics magazine. In 2005, he and a staff of reporters decided to take on the factual and scientific claims made by members of the 9-11 conspiracy movement. The results were first published in a magazine article, then more fully developed in a book titled Debunking 9-11 Myths, Why Conspiracy Theories Can't Stand Up to the Facts. I think what Popular Mechanics did with the 9-11 conspiracy theory was just about one of the best things ever done in the history of skepticism. That is exactly how it should be done. Here's the claim, here's the answer. Here's the claim, here's the answer. By the end, they got nothing to stand on. Boom, end of story. But is it really so? The debate on September 11 can roughly be divided into these areas of discussion. We have the four hijackings as the overarching event of the day, and we have the three different locations that were hit by the four airplanes. One of them hit the Pentagon, another crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, the other two hit the Twin Towers in New York. The debate on the hijackings is divided in three parts. The first one focuses on the air defense and whether the failure to intercept the hijacked airplanes was accidental or intentional. The second focuses on the hijackers and whether they were actually aboard the airplanes or just the usual patsies. The third part focuses on the aircraft themselves and whether the four airplanes used in the attacks were the same ones that took off from the airports that morning or were something that only resembled them from the outside. What initially raised suspicions on the true role of the military on September 11 is the fact that the U.S. air defense, which is arguably the most advanced and sophisticated in the world, was unable to intercept even one of the four hijacked airplanes in the course of over one and a half hours. I remember thinking, where on earth are the interceptors? I'm an old interceptor pilot, and it's absolutely 
unbelievable that hijacked airliners could fly around for an hour and 40 minutes without being intercepted. Uh, as a former Minister of National Defense, why did airplanes fly around for an hour and a half without interceptors being uh, scrambled? Take them uh, you know, with a quick reaction alert, they should have been in the air in five minutes or ten minutes. If not, as a Minister of National Defense, uh, what's, I would want to say, why not? This astonishing failure to respond was remarked by Senator Mark Dayton in the post-9-11 congressional hearings. But what I find much more shocking and alarming were the repeated and catastrophic failures of the leaders in charge and the other people responsible to do their jobs, to follow established procedures, to follow direct orders from civilian and military commanders. The official justification for this failure is a series of blunders, miscommunications, and mistakes that has come to be known as the incompetence theory. On that day, you saw a lot of well-meaning, confused people struggling to make sense of a, of a terrible situation. They didn't even know where the planes were. One argument for the incompetence theory is that the air defense was conceived to protect the U.S. from external threats, not internal ones. The fact is that our, our air defenses, uh, the whole NORAD system, was not at all geared towards protecting us from domestic aircraft, quite the contrary. It was all set up to detect aircraft coming in from overseas. La difesa era predisposta per difendersi da attacchi provenienti dall'esterno. L'America era come fosse una, un castello con un fossato, ma questi hanno usato una catapulta per entrare, saltando il fossato, si sono trovati all'interno, nel ventre mole dell'America, what the debunkers forget to mention is that the responsibility for tracking internal hijacks has never fallen on the military to begin with. This has always been the duty of the Civil Air Traffic Controllers, the FAA, as explained by the Secretary of Defense himself. So the Department of Defense was oriented externally. Our radars were pointing out, not in, and the FAA was the one that, that then had the responsibility to say there's a hijack. Only then, explains author and researcher Nafiz Ahmed, is the military requested for assistance in scrambling their jets. Standard operating procedures dictate that as soon as a plane flies off course, the FAA will contact the plane and try to ask them what is going on. If there is a problem or if they cannot establish radio contact, then immediately the FAA will contact the Pentagon who will, within a matter of minutes, a maximum of 10 minutes normally, will scramble fighter jets to intercept the civilian plane and to analyze the situation and see what is going on. The FAA authority over the national airspace is clearly acknowledged in this exchange between the military from September 11. If you can, hand the fighters over directly to FAA so they they're still under FAA control. We're never going to take them. Just work with them, coordinate with them as best that you can with that. Take them to the area and let them handle that airspace. Another argument for the incompetence theory is that by turning off the transponders, the hijackers had made the airplanes very difficult to be tracked on radar. That can't be overstated. The fact that once the hijackers turned off the transponders, uh, you had air traffic control who were looking at something like 4,500 primary radar blips. They were trying to pick out the plane that they just lost. Non sapevano dove andare perché i terroristi hanno disattivato un dispositivo che si chiama transponder che localizza l'aeroplano. Spento quello, puff, sparisce il puntino. E dov'è? Non si sa dove è. This is not true. When the transponder is turned off, the controllers lose the information on the altitude, but they can still track the plane as a primary signal. The following example shows how long it took an air traffic controller to find American 11 on his screen after he was told the plane had been hijacked. Uh, good morning, uh, Boston. I got a situation here with American 11. We believe it's by uh, possible hijack. Okay, tell me more. Uh, we lost radio communications with him, then we lost uh, his transponder, and right now the uh, aircraft is just west of Albany going southbound. Okay, I see him. United 175 never turned the transponder off. It just switched codes. United 175 is 50 miles northwest of New York City when its transponder code is suddenly changed. As I look up, I notice that United 175's code has changed. I just turned around and radioed the pilot. My exact words were United 175, recycle transponder squawk. Hijacker Al Shahi obviously intended to turn off that uh, transponder, but because he just changed codes and didn't turn it off, he still left the controllers with a very clear indication of the normal return from an aircraft that was squawking, that's what we call it, with the altitude. 
According to the Secret Service, the plane that hit the Pentagon was tracked for at least 30 minutes before it reached Washington. Nelson Garabito was the Secret Service agent in charge of protecting the White House airspace. First thing I did is I picked up the phone to call my, my contact, the FAA. He said, we have four planes outstanding. Uh, two have hit the towers and two are headed to Washington, D.C. One of them approximately 30 minutes out, one of them approximately 45 minutes out. The one 30 minutes out turned out to be the plane that hit the Pentagon. As the one nearest us got closer and closer, six minutes out, five minutes out. We knew it was sort of over the CIA and we thought, is that where it's going? Um, but it, it kept coming. United 93 was also being tracked after the hijacking. We were tracking United 93, and I was in conversation with the FBI agent, and he was relaying to me that we suspect that this aircraft has uh, now been taken over by hostile forces, described the sharp turn it made over uh, eastern Ohio, and now is heading back uh, along southwestern Pennsylvania. The airplane was being followed step by step, practically in real time. He's, uh, right now, he is west of Johnstown still. 12 miles. At some point, it even turned the transponder back on, showing not only its position, but also the altitude. It looks like he's still turning. Hey, his transponder just came back on and it was showing 8,000 feet, 200. 8,200 feet. 8,200 feet, and he's on the same code that he was before. Save for some moments of confusion, the four airplanes were being tracked by air traffic controllers all along. The real reason for the failure to intercept the four aircraft seems to have been the high number of military exercises that were being run by NORAD on September 11 out of their base in Cheyenne Mountain, Colorado. As Webster Tarpley noted in his book 9-11 Synthetic Terror, staff exercises or command exercises are perfect for a rogue network, which is forced to conduct its operations using the same communications and computer systems used by other officers who are not necessarily party to the illegal operation. Interestingly enough, on the evening of September 10th, the security level for the NORAD computer system called Infocon had been dropped to normal, the lowest level. This made it easier for anyone to penetrate or compromise the computer networks of the air defense system. On September 11, between four and 10 military exercises had been scheduled, some of them involving false hijacks of commercial airplanes. This unusual number of exercises had two major consequences. One, they moved a large number of fighters out to Canada and Alaska. Two, they created a major confusion in the system as soon as the real hijackings were reported. We have a hijacked aircraft headed towards New York, and we need you guys to, we need someone to scramble some S-16s or something up there to help us out. Is this, is this real world or exercise? No, this is not an exercise manifest. The process of authorization for scrambles was lengthy and complicated. Hey, uh, we just, I just talked to Otis here, and they said they needed a NEAD authorization. Confusion and pressure kept mounting. I don't know where I'm scrambling these guys to. I need a direction, a destination. At times, communications were jammed. If you could do me a favor and have them call us, we cannot call out for some reason. Some in the military quickly realized the simulations were causing a problem. You know, let's get rid of this goddamn sim. Hey, turn the sim switches off. Let's get rid of that crap. I hope they cancel the exercise because this is ridiculous. But they were not canceled. Even after both towers in New York had been hit, when everyone knew America was under attack, the war games continued. You guys watching the news? Yeah. I wasn't sure. I've been watching it for about 10 minutes. Did they suspend the exercise? Uh, not at this time, no. Apparently, someone took advantage of the situation. While the plane headed for the Pentagon was quickly approaching from the west, an unknown source, which was never identified, reported that American 11 was headed towards the capital even though the plane had already crashed into the North Tower. I just had a report that American 11 is still in the air and it's heading towards Washington. Okay, American 11 is still in the air? This attracted all the attention towards the so-called phantom plane. He's still airborne, he's still a hijack out there, but we can't get a position on him. The jets from Langley were prepared to intercept it. I don't know if they might want to alert some aircraft down there, though, too. We have Langley on battle stations right now. Okay. Then they were scrambled straight for Washington. Foxy, scramble Langley, head towards the Washington area. Roger that. But a different command post, called Giant Killer, sent the fighters out to the ocean. Say again, where you want them? Uh, we want them in the Whiskey 386 area. This didn't sit well with the operations center. American Giant Killer and their wisdom sent them out over the water when we scrambled them to Washington. By the time the plane headed for the Pentagon was circling the capital, it was too late for the Langley jets to intercept it. 
Even after the Pentagon was hit, the war games were not suspended. And again, while United 93 was being hijacked, another false alarm attracted the attention in the opposite direction. Uh, did you get the word? I got a Delta 8 Niner, south southeast of Toledo. Delta 8 Niner, that's a hijack. They think it's possible hijack. Fuck, south of Cleveland, we have a code on it now. Good, pick it up, find it. Fuck, another one. Major Nazipani turned to Toledo Air Force Base. I'm sorry to be so uh, brief and quick on this, but uh, there's another possible hijack to about 50 miles east of Toledo. And you guys are the closest, and we need somebody airborne. But instead of getting help, his authority was questioned. What authority is this coming from? Uh, what a, sir, what authority is this coming from? Uh, yeah. uh, the DO, is the best I can tell you. Nazipani vented his frustration to his superior, Colonel Marr. He's going to tell his commander, the commander's going to call you, because he doesn't believe the authority. Then they tried Duluth Air Force Base. What about yeah. Duluth? Okay, Duluth, you got no fighters. Nazipani went all the way to the western quadrant looking for help. This is Major Cheney, who is this? Hey, Cheney, this is Nasty, how you doing? Hey, doing all right. Hey, we're not doing so good right now. Uh, what I'd like to do, uh, possibly steal some aircraft out of Fargo from you guys. But here, too, there were no planes ready for scramble. They tried Syracuse, but 20 minutes was the best they could do. Syracuse 2 airborne in 20 minutes. They tried Alpina, but the planes were just returning from their training. The Alpina thing isn't what we thought. There's four guys coming home from the range right now. They started looking for planes that were already up in the air for exercises. So, anybody in training, send them home. He's moving the oceans of Falcon, send them home. But those planes were spent at that point. They got no weapon here. They just went on a straight run up to the range. They blew all the road. By the time refueled and armed jets were finally scrambled, the Delta flight turned out to be another false alarm. He was a hijacked aircraft. He is not a hijacked aircraft. He's taking precautionary measures and he's landing at Cleveland Center. Only after the Delta flight had landed were the war games finally suspended. So this is our Captain Taylor calling from China, Mount Yes. Uh, what we need you to do right now is to terminate all exercise inputs coming into China Mountain. By then, also the fourth hijacked airplane had been turned into a pile of smoking rubble. Yet General Myers, who was the highest military authority on September 11, has denied that the war games affected the military capacity of response. And the question was um, whether or not the activities of the four war games going on on September 11th actually impaired our ability to, to respond to the attacks. Uh, the answer to the question is no, did not impair our response. Fact, General Myers forgot to mention that on the morning of September 11, only four planes were armed and ready to intercept terrorists in the eastern region of the country. I've determined, of course, that with only four aircraft, we cannot defend the whole northeastern United States. That was the sensation of frustration, of I don't have the forces available to do anything about this. Myers instead has even suggested that the war games helped the military response. Uh, General Eberhardt, who was in the commander of North American Aerospace Defense Command, as he testified in front of the 9-11 Commission, I believe he told him that it enhanced our ability to respond. What that means is all the battle positions that uh, are normally not filled are indeed filled. So it was an easy transition from an exercise into a real-world situation. Actually, Again, Myers forgot to mention that the transition took place only after all tragic events had ended around 11 o'clock. By 11 o'clock, the sense of alarm had spread across the country. Fighter jets actually patrolling the skies. It was a war zone. Our skies were turned into a war zone. Everywhere you turn, it was military jets and helicopters everywhere. George Bush returned to Washington on the evening of September 11. The president finally returns to Washington. An escort of six helicopters was waiting for him. 300 fighters were defending the skies. Had there been 300 fighters ready to defend the skies on the morning of September 11, would the terrorist attacks have turned out the same way? This leads us straight into a pivotal question. Was the choice of scheduling so many exercises in the same day just a misfortunate call, or was it intentional? To answer this question, we need to take a closer look at some of the warnings the U.S. had received in the months prior to September 11. By the spring of 2001, the system was blinking red, according to intelligence chiefs. The U.S. administration has always maintained that they knew the attacks were on their way, but they didn't have specific information on them. I knew there was another attack planning. I knew there was another attack coming. Uh, and, and the obvious question behind that is, well, why didn't you do something about it? 
We had no specific information. It was not specific as to time, nor place, nor manner of attack. No specific threat involving uh, really a domestic operation or involving uh, what happened, obviously, uh, the city's uh, airliner and so forth. There uh, were uh, no warning signs that I'm aware of that would indicate this type of operation in the country. All these statements are false. A joint congressional inquiry on September 11 has revealed that in spring and summer of 2001, there had been a flood of warnings about possible terrorist attacks in the United States, some using airplanes as weapons. In fact, as reported by the New York Times, American aviation officials were warned as early as 1998 that Al-Qaeda could seek to hijack a commercial jet and slam it into a U.S. landmark. The London Times has revealed that the British MI6 had warned the American intelligence services about a plot to hijack aircraft and crash them into buildings two years before the September 11 attacks. Russian President Vladimir Putin has said publicly that he ordered his intelligence agencies to alert the United States last summer in 2001 that suicide pilots were training for attacks on U.S. targets. German intelligence alerted the CIA in June 2001 that Middle Eastern terrorists were training for hijackings. The Sunday Herald has confirmed that Britain gave President Bush a categorical warning to expect multiple airline hijackings one month before the September 11 attacks. Then there was the infamous August 6th memo. President Bush was told in August that Osama bin Laden might be planning an attack involving the hijacking of U.S. aircraft. It's titled bin Laden determined to strike in U.S. The two-page memo states, FBI information indicates patterns of suspicious activity in this country, consistent with preparations for hijackings or other types of attacks. Maybe it's no coincidence that the FBI advised their own boss to stop flying commercial airliners as early as six weeks before 9-11. Why is the Attorney General of the United States doing all his air travel by specially chartered jet? The Justice Department cited what it called a threat assessment by the FBI and said Ashcroft has been advised to travel only by private jet for the remainder of his term. At this point, we can pose the following question. Knowing that the attacks were imminent, knowing that they might involve hijacked airliners, but not knowing where and when they could happen, would have been a good reason to beef up the defense and keep even more jets than usual on alert all across the country. Why instead schedule so many exercises in one day while leaving only four jets on alert to defend the very sector of the country that was most likely to be attacked? To bring even more confusion into the situation was a series of last-minute replacements and unexplained absences within the chain of command. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was General Henry Shelton, but on September 11, he was absent, and his post was taken by his deputy, General Richard B. Myers. The FAA's National Operations Manager was Ben Sliney. On the morning of September 11, Sliney had been on that job for less than one day. The protocols required for Mr. Sliney to speak directly with the hijack coordinator, Lieutenant General Mike Canavan. But Canavan on that day was in Puerto Rico, and apparently he had forgotten to designate a replacement. In regards to the ensuing confusion, Mr. Sliney has stated, that's incredible, there is only one person. There must be someone designated or someone who will assume the responsibility of issuing an order. At the head of the National Command Center was General Montague Winfield. But on the evening of September 10th, Winfield instructed Captain Charles Leidig to take his place on the following morning. Leidig had been just recently certified for that post and was also on his first day on the job. At the Operation Command of NEADS was Colonel Marr. When Marr called his superior, General Arnold, to get authorization to scramble the jets from Otis, he was told that Arnold was in a meeting where he could not be reached by telephone. Marr had to physically send a messenger looking for him. Precious minutes were lost as Marr waited for Arnold to return his call, and when the fighters were finally scrambled, it was too late for them to intercept American 11. The top commander in charge of NORAD was General Ralph Eberhard, who was stationed at Peterson Air Force Base in Colorado. Eberhard told the 9-11 Commission that he was made aware of the first hijacking practically at the same time American 11 slammed into the North Tower. He then went to his office and saw the CNN broadcast of the World Trade Center explosion. After the second impact, writes the commission, it was obvious to Eberhard that there was an ongoing and coordinated terrorist attack. At that point, Eberhard called General Myers to update him on the situation. 
But even though both generals knew the country was being attacked by hijacked airplanes, neither of them suggested suspending the war games and recalling all the fighters available as soon as possible. Furthermore, instead of getting on the phone and taking control of the situation, in the most crucial moment of the day, General Eberhardt chose to get in his car and drive from the Peterson base to Cheyenne Mountain. The 30-minute drive put him completely out of the loop, since Eberhard couldn't receive telephone calls, wrote the Denver Post, as senior officials weighed how to respond. General Eberhardt was also the person responsible for lowering the security level of the defense computer system on the evening of September 10th. And then there was Donald Rumsfeld. As stated by the 9-11 Commission, procedures called for the hijack coordinator on duty to contact the National Military Command Center and to ask for a military escort aircraft to follow the flight. The NMCC would then seek approval from the Office of the Secretary of Defense to provide military assistance. If approval was given, the order would be transmitted down NORAD's chain of command. But this kind of procedure becomes difficult to follow when the hijack coordinator is in Puerto Rico. No one knows who the replacement is. The military command is in the hands of a total rookie and the Secretary of Defense is nowhere to be found. Donald Rumsfeld told CNN that he was informed of the Trade Center being hit some 15 minutes before the Pentagon was hit. This places the episode around 9.22 in the morning. And after the Pentagon was hit, rather than go to the command center and take charge of the situation, the Secretary of Defense chose to lend a helping hand on the Pentagon's lawn. It's almost as if Rumsfeld didn't feel the need to be informed about what was happening to his country under attack. The Secretary of Defense is outside the burning building, while inside the Pentagon. For 30 minutes, we couldn't find him. Uh, and just as we began to worry, he walked into the door of the National Military Command Center. By the time Rumsfeld walked into that door, all major events had ended. In fact, Rumsfeld told the 9-11 Commission that he was just gaining situational awareness when he spoke with the Vice President at 10.39. That's more than one and a half hours after the whole world knew that America was under attack. Why would so many rookies be placed in key positions? And why would so many top officials be either absent or unavailable on a day when so many exercises were scheduled is a question that remains to be answered. Question. After having realized that the country was being attacked by hijacked airplanes at 9.03, why didn't Eberhard immediately suspend all the war games and recall all the available jets to their bases? Why didn't Myers order him to do so after having been briefed by Eberhard on the ongoing attack? And why hasn't the 9-11 Commission ever asked either general these most fundamental questions? The final argument against the incompetence theory is offered by researcher Nafiz Ahmed. If we try to explain it by using the incompetence theory, it doesn't make sense. For example, if, if it was incompetence, we would expect that there would have been a normal inquiry into what went wrong. We would have expected that there would be some kind of reprimands, that certain officials would be um, downgraded or they would lose their jobs or something would have happened to correct the situation. But we find that there has been no such reprimands at all. Not only that didn't happen, but the opposite took place. After 9-11, most of the high-ranking people involved in this catastrophic failure were either confirmed to their post or promoted to higher levels. Condoleezza Rice, who had misrepresented the information the government had on the attacks in a sworn testimony, kept her post as National Security Advisor and went on to become Secretary of State in the following Bush administration. General Eberhard, the NORAD commander who didn't think of recalling the war games as soon as he knew his country was under attack, was chosen to lead the newly created U.S. Northern Command, which the Department of Defense has termed the nation's premier military homeland defense organization. Donald Rumsfeld, who acted more like an estranged passerby than the Secretary of Defense, kept his post at the Pentagon and began enjoying the largest increase in military spending after the Vietnam War. Richard B. Myers, despite the total breakdown under his leadership, was promoted to chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the highest military post in the country. On September 13, confirmation hearings were held for General Myers, as if nothing ever happened, while people were still being pulled alive from the rubble at Ground Zero. While at the Pentagon, the military appeared completely aloof from the events unfolding. At the White House, the coordination activities seemed to be concentrating under the firm authority of Vice President Cheney. In fact, the so-called NORAD tapes have revealed that the White House had ground-to-air missiles of their own. Hello there, 
Washington approach. All right. Make sure that the center does not have anything above our airspace also. The Secret Service is going to start shooting at anything in the air. Yeah, I just got a call from Washington. They said that uh, if there's anything above their airspace, the Secret Service is going to uh, free fire. This exchange, which took place around 10 a.m., sheds a whole new light on one of the most controversial issues of 9-11. The sworn testimony by Secretary of Transportation Norman Mineta to the 9-11 Commission on May 2003. Mineta was being questioned about the events that took place in the PIOC, the underground bunker in the White House, from where Dick Cheney took charge of the situation after convincing President Bush to stay away from Washington for safety reasons. To fully understand the implications of this case, two things must be kept in mind. One is that according to the official version, Flight 77 crashed into the Pentagon at 9.37, while Flight United 93 crashed in Pennsylvania at 10.03. It's on this 26-minute window that hinges the whole credibility of the Vice President on his true role in the September 11 attacks. The second thing to keep in mind is that the order to shoot down civilian airliners came from the President through the Vice President only after the Pentagon had been hit. When the third plane hit the Pentagon, the magnitude of the attacks uh, grew dramatically. We didn't know if there were other planes that had been hijacked. So the first decision I made on Air Force One was to give our Air Force orders to shoot down commercial aircraft did, that did not respond. This means that any order given before the Pentagon was hit could not have been a shoot down order. However, as Chairman Hamilton was inquiring about the shoot-down order, something unexpected emerged from Mineta on the plane that hit the Pentagon. And uh, we had that order given, I think it was by the President, that uh, authorized uh, the shooting down of commercial aircraft that were suspected to be controlled by terrorists. Um, were you there when that order was given? No, I, I was not. I was made aware of it. Uh, during the time that the airplane coming in to the Pentagon, uh, there was a young man who would come in and say, have you heard anything to the contrary? Well, at the time, I didn't know what all that meant. And... Um, the flight you're referring to is the... The one flight that came into the Pentagon. Pentagon. Yeah. Mineta's deposition posed a major problem. Since the shoot-down order was given only after the Pentagon was hit, Cheney's order sounded very much like one not to shoot down the plane. Hamilton immediately suggested that what Mineta had witnessed was also a shoot-down order. Let me see if I understand. The, the plane that was headed toward the Pentagon and was uh, some miles away, there, there was an order to shoot that plane down. Well, I don't know that specifically. Commissioner Romer picked up where Hamilton left off. You said, uh, if I understood you correctly, that you were not in the room when the decision was made to what you inferred was a decision made to attempt to shoot down Flight 77 before it crashed into the Pentagon. Is that correct? I didn't know about the shooting the order to shoot down. Commissioner Romer then tried to suggest a different solution. Was there another line of communication between the vice president and you said you saw Mr. Richard Clark on your way in. Was Clark running an operations center as well uh, on that day? Dick uh, was in the situation room. So there was a situation room making decisions about what was going to happen on I shoot don't downs believe they as were well making... as the PIOC? I don't believe they were making any decisions. I think they were more information gathering from uh, various agencies. Could it have been in the situation room where somebody in the situation room recommended the shoot down and the vice president agreed to that? Commissioner Romer, I would assume that a decision of that nature would have been, would have had to be made at a much higher level than the people who were in the situation room. Unable to resolve the discrepancy, the 9-11 Commission took a series of dramatic steps. Firstly, they simply excluded Mineta's testimony from the final report. In the 560 pages of the report, Norman Mineta is mentioned only once, in an unrelated circumstance. His presence in the PIOC is never even acknowledged, and the video segment you have just seen has been removed from the Commission's official website, and it's no longer available. 
Secondly, the 9-11 Commission moved Dick Cheney's arrival in the PIOC to after the Pentagon had been hit. From the final report we read, the Vice President entered the underground tunnel leading to the shelter at 9.37, which is the same time the Pentagon was hit. The Commission stated that Dick Cheney remained in the tunnel for more than 20 minutes trying to complete a call to the President and that he only entered the PIOC at 9.58. Why would the vice president spend more than 20 minutes in a tunnel trying to make a phone call when the PIOC is fully equipped with all kinds of telephones has never been explained. As a third step, the commission moved the exchange with the young man to after 10 o'clock and rewrote it in order to reconcile it with the official version. From the final report we read, at some time between 10.10 and 10.15, a military aide told the vice president and others that the aircraft was 80 miles out Vice President Cheney was asked for authority to engage the aircraft. The military aide returned a few minutes later and said the aircraft was 60 miles out. He again asked for authorization to engage. The vice president again said yes. In summary, the window of time Mineta described as during the time of the plane coming into the Pentagon had become 1010 to 1015 in the commission report. The 50 miles out reference by Mineta had become 80 and 60 miles out in the report. The 30 miles out and 10 miles out mentions by Mineta were removed, and the unspecified order by Dick Cheney to the young man had become a straightforward shoot-down order. And now that the episode had been moved to after 10 o'clock, the commission could maintain that the exchange Mineta had witnessed was referring to Flight 93 when the shoot-down order was already in place, and not to the flight that hit the Pentagon. There was only one problem with this version of the events. Norman Mineta had to be terribly confused in his recollections, as he could not have been with the vice president in the PIOC at the time the Pentagon was hit. To support this theory, the debunkers point at a statement by Mineta who said he arrived at the White House while it was being evacuated. Since the official order of the evacuation came at 9.45, contend the debunkers, Mineta could not have been with the vice president in the PIOC at the time the Pentagon was hit. But in the same deposition, Mineta also stated that he arrived at the PIOC at about 9.20 a.m., so it's presumable that he was referring to the people that had already started leaving the White House before the official order of evacuation was given. In fact, at 9.52, CNN reported that a slow evacuation of the White House had started some 30 minutes earlier, much before the official order was given. But the main problem with placing Cheney's removal from his office at 9.37 is Dick Cheney himself. On September 16, five days after the events, Cheney stated on Meet the Press that he was taken into the bunker shortly after the second tower was hit, which happened at 9.03. So we turned on the television and watched for a few minutes and then actually saw the second plane hit uh, the World Trade Center. I talked with the president while I was uh, there over the next several minutes watching developments on the television and as we started to get organized to, uh, to figure out what to do, my uh, Secret Service agents came in and uh, they uh, hoisted me up and moved me very rapidly down the hallway, down some stairs, through some doors and down some more stairs into an underground facility and uh, they did that because uh, they'd received a report that an airplane was headed for the White House. There are also several highly credible testimonies that placed Dick Cheney's removal from his office shortly after 9.03. ABC News quoted White House photographer David Borer saying that just after 9 a.m., Vice President Dick Cheney was in his West Wing office when two or three agents came in and told him, Sir, you have to come with us. Agents came inside the office and said, uh, Sir, you have to come with us. The New York Times reported the same story. At 9.03 a.m., as Vice President Cheney was staring at the TV screen, the second hijacked airliner exploded against the Twin Towers. At that moment, the Secret Service grabbed him and hurried him down to Piak. Richard Clark, in his book Against All Enemies, wrote that soon after the second tower was hit, Cheney began to gather up his papers. As I left, I counted eight Secret Service agents ready to move to the PIOC. President Bush's secretary, Ashley Estes, stated, As the second plane hit, it didn't really click exactly what happened. Then I heard a noise, like a body bumping a door. I looked out into a hallway and saw the vice president with the Secret Service. They had kind of lifted him up and were running with him, at that point, it definitely registered what it was. 
Former Undersecretary of Defense Eric Edelman testified, I was already down in the PIOC with the Vice President when we got word there had been an explosion at the Pentagon. And even after 10 years, Dick Cheney has not changed his story one bit. As we watched, we saw the second plane strike. And uh, then we knew it was, was a terrorist attack. Then uh, my Secret Service agent, lead agent, came bursting through the door of my office and uh, said, sir, we have to leave now. While all these testimonies clearly placed Dick Cheney in the PIOC by the time the Pentagon was hit, the 9-11 Commission has admitted that the 9.37 entry time by Dick Cheney in the tunnel was based on alarm data, which is no longer retrievable. And, most important of all, Mineta himself recalls being with the vice president by the time the Pentagon was hit. So then someone came in and said, uh, uh, Mr. Vice President, the, uh, there's been an explosion at the, at the uh, Pentagon. In the course of time, Secretary Mineta has never changed his story, repeatedly confirming both the location and the timing of the event. And then all of a sudden, as I was talking to him, he said, uh, oh, I lost the uh, bogey, lost the target. I said, well, where is it? He said, well, somewhere between Roslyn and uh, National Airport. And about that time, someone broke into the conversation. I said, Mr. Secretary, we just had a confirmation from an Arlington County police officer saying that he saw a, an American Airlines plane go into the Pentagon. That the exchange Manetta witnessed was referring to the plane that hit the Pentagon should be beyond doubt at this point. But we still don't know what was the order given by Dick Cheney to the young military, whose name turned out to be Douglas Cochran. In 2010, some researchers tracked down Mr. Cochran and asked him to clarify what the orders by Dick Cheney were. Mr. Cochran confirmed being the person involved in the exchange, but declined to elaborate. He simply stated that, everything that happened on that day has been well documented. The 9-11 Commission report is the authoritative narrative on the events of 9-11. I have nothing to add. In fact, it turns out that in 2004, the 9-11 Commission did interview Douglas Cochran, military aide to the vice president, on the inbound aircraft and on the shoot-down language used. But his interview has been withdrawn from public access, and to this day, it remains classified. While we wait for that document to be declassified, we can piece together the information we already have. One. The sky over Washington is Class Bravo, restricted airspace. It's called Prohibited Area 56. In order to enter it, an airplane must have clearance from air traffic controllers, active two-way radio communications, and its transponder must be on. Otherwise, it's to be considered hostile and it could be shot down. Two, as explained by former Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger, in a time of crisis, the Washington airspace goes into an actual lockdown. You would do what, what is being done, and that is closing off the entire airspace so that, you, in, in effect, the whole Washington area is a no-fly zone, so that any planes that are, can't identify themselves and get into that uh, are uh, to be shot down. Three, the White House had ground-to-air missiles of their own. Hello there, Washington approach. Hi. Make sure that the center does not have anything above our airspace also. The Secret Service is going to start shooting at anything in the air. Four. As the unknown airplane was approaching the protected airspace, it had no clearance from air traffic controllers, no radio communications active, and the transponder was off. He said, we're tracking an airplane coming in, but the transponder has been turned off. So we don't have any identification on the airplane. We know it's coming in fast. A representation of the FAA radar scope, based on information obtained by 2020, shows the plane headed straight for what is known as P-56, prohibited airspace 56, which covers the White House and the Capitol, at a speed of about 500 miles an hour, with no radio contact whatsoever. This made it a perfect candidate for a shootdown, especially after two towers in New York had already been hit by an airplane. Five. The Secret Service had known about the incoming airplane for the last 30 minutes, so it's presumable they would have been ready to shoot it down if it became necessary. One of them approximately 30 minutes out, one of them approximately 45 minutes out. So we knew we had some, some time, but little time. Despite all this, no one moved a finger as the unknown threat kept rushing towards the Capitol. Someone came in and said to the Vice President, uh, there's a plane out about 50 miles out. As the one nearest us got closer and closer, six minutes out, five minutes out. The same person said to the vice president, uh, Mr. Vice President, there's a plane 30 miles out. 
And then at one point, um, we got under a minute, and I said it's about 30 seconds out. The Washington controllers came up on the speakerphone. They started counting down 10 miles from the White House. The young man said, Mr. Vice President, the plane's 10 miles out. Um, do the orders still stand? And the vice president sort of whipped his head around and said, of course they do. Nine miles from the White House, eight miles from the White House, all the way down to one mile from the White House. But no missile was fired. Undisturbed, the plane circled the White House and went on to strike the Pentagon, causing the death of at least 125 people between military and civilians on the ground. Question. The Secret Service knew about the incoming plane for the last 30 minutes, was following it on radar, had the means to shoot it down, and should have done so in order to protect the Capitol, but they didn't. Why? In regards to the exchange between Cheney and the young man, can you suggest anything different from an order not to shoot down the plane as it was approaching Washington's protected airspace? While the military defense leaves many unanswered questions, even more doubts arise when taking a closer look at the 19 alleged terrorists. The first problem is that apparently these guys could barely fly at all. While they are known to have taken some flight lessons with small single-engine airplanes, none of them had ever flown a jet before in their life, let alone a large commercial airliner, which is obviously a league of its own. Adam Shaw is an acrobatic pilot and a flight instructor with 6,000 hours of experience, half of which spent flying upside down. For people who are really piss-poor student pilots, to be able to get in the cockpit of uh, big jets and fly them as accurately as they were flown at close to max speed and be able to hit the trade towers. The idea that someone could make the transition from a small single-engine plane traveling at 100 miles an hour to a commercial airliner traveling at 500 miles an hour without a long, exhaustive training is very hard to believe. People don't realize that to hand fly an airliner at those speeds is extremely difficult, and particularly if you're a novice, because a novice that's learned in little airplanes, they over control everything. To justify this apparently impossible transition, the debunkers maintained that the terrorist had spent some time in flight simulators, and that the equipment they encountered in the Boeing cockpits on September 11 was similar to the simulators they had trained on. But this is false. For example, the only simulator Hani Hanjur is known to have ever trained in is the Boeing 737, an airplane designed in the 70s, with a totally different cockpit from the 757 he is alleged to have hijacked on September 11. If anything, his training would have confused him, not helped him in any way. Another argument by the debunkers is that all the hijackers really had to do once in the cockpits was to set the automatic pilot in order to reach their targets. But this is hardly what happened on September 11. Dave Bottiglia is the air traffic controller who followed the hijacking of United 175. Now as I'm watching, United 175 makes a hard left-hand turn and starts climbing. Not only did he make a sharp turn, but he also climbed 3,000 feet in a matter of approximately one minute, which is a very fast rate of climb. This is something that we have never seen before. After the sudden ascent, the plane started a breathtaking descent toward the ground. We were counting down the altitudes, and they were descending right at the end at 10,000 feet per minute. That is absolutely unheard of for a commercial jet. This is certainly not the way the automatic pilot would have taken you to Kennedy Airport. It is unbelievable for the passengers in the back to withstand that type of force as they're descending. They're actually nosing the airplane down and doing it what I would call a power dive. At 9.01 a.m., United 175 is hurtling at more than 400 miles per hour toward the Statue of Liberty and New York Harbor. One of the controllers started counting out the altitudes. And he says, my God, he's going down at 8,000 feet a minute. Now it's 10,000 feet a minute. And he counted off eight, six, four. And he says, my God, he's in the ground on the next hit. But he was not. 
According to the official version, Marwan al Sheki, a 23-year-old who has never flown a jet before in his life, levels the course, visually identifies the target, and performs a spectacular banking maneuver that brings the 767 to hit the South Tower under the world's astonished eyes. Question. Marwan El Sheikhi had never flown a jet before in his life, let alone a huge airliner. How was he able to perform ascents of 3,000 feet per minute and plunges of 10,000 feet per minute while keeping full control of the plane? And why would he want to take such unnecessary risks, including collisions with other airliners, instead of flying safely with the autopilot towards the intended target? Ziad Jarrah, the alleged hijacker of Flight 93, wasn't known for his piloting skills either. As reported by the 9-11 Commission in July 2001, he had asked to fly the Hudson Corridor near Manhattan with a small private plane. But because Hortman Flight School deemed Gerard unfit to fly solo, he could fly this route only accompanied by an instructor. Yet we are asked to believe that only two months later, the same person was able to fully control a 100-ton airliner and perform some extreme descending maneuvers observed by Cleveland's air traffic controllers. I see this plane climbed up from his assigned altitude to 35, of 35,000 feet to 41,000 feet, turned around and aimed right back at where we were and descended rapidly. And when a plane descends too fast, the computer can't keep up with it. Ziad Jarrah had never flown a jet before in his life, let alone a large airliner. And even his experience with small airplanes was rather poor. How could he perform a descent so fast that the computer can't keep up with it while maintaining full control of the plane? And why would he need to take such an unnecessary risk, including collisions with other airplanes, instead of safely flying with the autopilot towards the intended target? But the feat of the century must be awarded to Hani Hanjur, a hopeless amateur who is alleged to have been at the controls of American 77. As he finally reached Washington and had the Pentagon in sight, Hani Hanjur did not make the easy choice and just plunge the plane onto the roofs of the building. He instead disconnected the autopilot and performed a hand-flown, high-speed descending maneuver of 330 degrees that brought him to lose sight of the target again while forcing him to a much more difficult approach close to the ground. Seen from above, the Pentagon offers some 30 acres of unobstructed target. Hitting it anywhere on the roofs would have caused a major devastation and possibly thousands of casualties. Coming in from the side instead, the approach is filled with obstacles and the target is reduced to a tiny strip of cement coming at you at 500 miles an hour. The debunkers, however, seem to have a good explanation for this apparently illogical maneuver. Normalmente l'air dovrebbe scendere in picchiata. Allora, si chiede a un pilota e il pilota ti dice subito, guarda che quella è la manovra più difficile, la fa un pilota esperto, un pilota di scarsa competenza usa l'aereo come se fosse un camion bomba, ossia vola orizzontalmente, vola basso centro all'edificio. This very question has already been posed to professional pilots. But the answer was not what Attivissimo claims. Se lei dovesse simulare il volo di uno che vuole colpire il pentagono, esatto, se la rossa quale sarebbe? sicuro lo colpirei sicuramente da questa parte qui. Cioè per essere sicuro un... arriverebbe dall'alto così. Arrivano qui perché o si colpiscono questi edifici, diciamo i primi che vengono, oppure si colpiscono gli edifici che sono subito dopo e quindi si crea comunque un elevato danno. Flying a jet near the ground instead does require some major skills even for the most seasoned pilot. Lei che ha tante ore di esperienza di volo, riuscirebbe a portare questo aereo negli ultimi 500 metri da qui a qui a 850 km all'ora? E dovrei metterci veramente tanto tanto impegno. La, la prima difficoltà sarebbe quella eh, di volare attaccato a terra. E, eh, lo so per esperienza diretta avendo fatto volo militare a bassa quota. E, eh, Perché il terreno corre via. Certo, corre a una velocità, velocità incredibile. Quindi credo che chi ha fatto eh, eh, questa attività eh, possa capire cosa vuol dire stare a 10 metri da terra, 5 metri da terra con un aeroplano che pesa 110-120 tonnellate lanciato a 900 km all'ora. Basta toccare la cross e schizza via. Come si fa a pilotare un aereo a 530 miglia all'ora a raso terra? È possibile? Eh, come diceva il collega, è estremamente difficile, è complesso anche perché un piccolissimo intervento sul piano verticale fa salire o scendere l'aeroplano, per cui 
anche un pilota abbastanza allenato avrebbe delle grosse difficoltà. The debunkers insist that the maneuver would have been doable even by an amateur like Hani Hanjour. Il y a des journalistes uh, aux Pays-Bas qui ont dit ben, on, va, on va voir, on va faire le test. To prove their point, the debunkers refer to a documentary by Dutch television in which the Pentagon attack is replicated in a flight simulator. Iets harder dan normaal. En dit is de Pentagon. Ik geef hem vol gas. En dan gaan we het En dan moet hij hier, of weer aan de, deze vleugel, moet hij de ingekrijgen. But this simulation doesn't seem very accurate. First of all, the approach is made from a much higher angle, while the real plane came in so low that it clipped some of the light poles as it was flying at ground level. Secondly, the documentary doesn't offer precise indications on the speeds used during the simulation. In a more accurate simulation, done with a pilot with an experience similar to Hani Hanjour, in fact, the air traffic controllers were so impressed with the speed of the maneuver, they thought they were looking at a military jet. But nobody knew that was a commercial flight at the time. Nobody knew that was American 77. Well, what did you think? It was a military flight of some kind? Of I thought it was a military flight. It was really moving fast. It was moving very fast, like a military aircraft might move at a low altitude. Air traffic controller Danielle O'Brien stated, the speed, the maneuverability, the way that he turned, we all thought in the radar room, all of us experienced air traffic controllers, that that was a military plane. You don't fly a 757 in that manner. It's unsafe. Several military and civil pilots have expressed their skepticism about the maneuver. Commander Ralph Colstead is a former fighter pilot, air flight instructor, and a retired commercial pilot with 27 years of experience. At the Pentagon, he stated, the pilot of the Boeing 757 did quite a feat of flying. I have 6,000 hours of flying in Boeing 757s and 767s, and could not have flown in the way the flight path was described. Commander Ted Muga, former civil and military pilot, I just can't imagine an amateur even being able to come close to performing a maneuver of that nature. Captain Russ Wittenberg, a former fighter pilot and an airline pilot for 35 years, for a guy to just jump into the cockpit and fly like an ace is impossible. There is not one chance in a thousand. To expect the alleged airplane to run these maneuvers with a total amateur at the controls is simply ludicrous. To be able to fly that curving, descending, high airspeed trajectory into a very low building, you have to be Chuck Yeager to fly that trajectory. Not only was Hani Hanjour no Chuck Yeager, but apparently he was a terrible pilot with small planes as well. An instructor from one of his flight schools stated, Hani Hanjour was not someone cut out to be a pilot. He had no motivation, a poor understanding of the basic principles of aviation, and poor judgment, combined with poor technical skills. The debunkers contend that Hanjour had obtained a regular pilot's license, and therefore he had to be able to fly. But it is exactly because of that license that major suspicions on Han Jur kept emerging. In a 2002 article called A Trainee Noted for Incompetence, the New York Times wrote that Han Jur was reported to the aviation agency after the instructors had found his piloting skills so shoddy and his grasp of English so inadequate that they questioned whether his pilot's license was genuine. The article concludes quoting a former employee at the flight school who said, I'm still to this day amazed that he could have flown into the Pentagon. He could not fly at all. The manager of another flight school in Phoenix said, I couldn't believe he had a commercial license of any kind with the skills that he had. At yet another flight school in Maryland, instructors found he had trouble controlling and landing the single-engine Cessna 172. This was confirmed in this radio interview by Nila Sagadevan, a pilot and an aeronautical engineer. You know, i got to say something about Hani Hanjo. I've spoken with two of his flight instructors. This guy could not solo a Cessna 150. Uh, it's a little single-engine two-seat trainer. And uh, what I mean by solo, it's a pilot's first time out without anyone else in the cockpit with him. It's the most simple, most fundamental flying exercise one can engage in. You're seated inside the aircraft, you hit the power, you take off, make a couple of 90 degree turns, maximum altitude of around 900 to 1000 feet, come back and land. One. You're saying 
This uh, alleged hijacker, Honey Anjur, could not solo 150. He could not solo. In fact, one of his flight instructors, and I quote him, he said, the man could not fly at all. How could an amateur who was deemed unable to fly solo in a Cessna 150 had a poor understanding of the basic principles of aviation and had never sat once in the cockpit of a 757 suddenly become able to control such a large airliner flying at top speeds? And even assuming he was able to reach Washington with the autopilot, why would he want to disconnect it and hand fly the plane for another eight long minutes, performing a totally unnecessary descending maneuver that A, would have drastically increased his chances of an unwanted crash, B, would have increased the danger of being intercepted, C, would have made him lose sight of the target again, D, would have forced him to a much more difficult approach near the ground, E, would have shrunk the target to a tiny strip of cement, F would have limited the possible damage to the external rings only when he could have maximized the damage and ensured the most spectacular outcome of the mission by plunging the plane onto the Pentagon's roofs from above. It should be noted that such an illogical maneuver from a terrorist's point of view becomes almost mandatory if seen from the opposite side of the chessboard. If the operation was in fact orchestrated by someone within the military, no one would want a 757 to plunge from the sky onto the Pentagon's roof. That would cause a major devastation, cost thousands of lives, and possibly kill generals and even the Secretary of Defense. To justify the claim of having been attacked, all that was needed was a strike on the side wall in a less populated area away from the top brass offices where the number of casualties would be kept to a minimum. Maybe it's just a coincidence, but the area of the Pentagon that was hit with the strange maneuver not only satisfied all these requisites, but had just been reinforced in order to withstand a terrorist attack. Exactly where the plane went in was an area that had recently been uh, re redeveloped with very heavy uh, blast walls and firewalls. All the outside windows had been equipped with uh, Kevlar coating to guard against blast. This portion of the building that had been remodeled, blast, heavy blast walls walls put in and the old portion had already been vacated uh, in preparations of the remodeling effort and the number of dead is probably considerably less than it would have been if this part of the Pentagon had been up to full staff. Fortunately too, this is exactly the opposite side of all the critical command centers in the Pentagon, the Secretary of uh, Defense's office, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs office, the National Military Command, where some of the most critical military decisions are made. Fortunately, they were all on the other side of the building. The renovated section had just been reinforced by floor-to-ceiling steel beams that ran through all five floors. When the building section collapsed, wrote the DOD, the structure was held together by the web of six by six inch steel columns. Between these columns was a Kevlar-like mesh, similar to the material in bulletproof vests, which kept masonry from becoming shrapnel in case of an explosion. Each blast-resistant window cost $10,000 and weighed about 2,500 pounds. The suspicion that a strike on this section of the building was expected doesn't rest on the major beefing up of the structure alone, Apparently, the rumor of a strike on the external ring had already been circulating among the top ranks of the military. On September 11, Jim Miklaszewski was the NBC correspondent at the Pentagon. The first time I heard the word terrorism out of any U.S. official uh, came shortly after the second plane had hit. And, uh, and I bumped into a U.S. military intelligence official and I said, look, what have you got? And he said, obviously, this is clearly an act of terrorism. And then he got very close to me and almost silent for a few seconds. And he leaned in and he said, this attack was so well coordinated that if I were you, I would stay off the E-ring where our NBC office was, the outer ring of the Pentagon, the rest of the day, because we're next. Question. Even if someone could predict that the Pentagon would become a target, one would imagine a plane to plunge from the skies onto the roofs of the building. Why would anyone suggest to stay away from the external ring, in particular, unless he knew in advance what was going to happen? While we were asked to believe that 19 Islamic terrorists were responsible for the hijacking, no one has ever produced a single image of these alleged terrorists boarding the four hijacked airplanes. 
All major airports in the world have security cameras practically everywhere, covering every public area of the airport 24 hours a day. But the only image of the terrorists released after 9-11 was this shot from a security camera showing alleged hijackers Abdulaziz Alomari and Mohammed Atta going through a security checkpoint. The two men, however, are not boarding flight American 11 from Boston to Los Angeles, but a previous connecting flight from Portland, Maine to Boston in the early hours of September 11. Only in 2005 were some images of the terrorists in one of the three airports released. They showed the group that allegedly hijacked Flight 77 passing through security checks at Washington Dulles. But the timestamp, which is always embedded in security camera recordings, was either cropped out or absent altogether. This means that the video could have been shot at any time prior to 9-11, possibly during a dry run the terrorists did along the same routes. In fact, the 9-11 Commission has stated that many of the terrorists, including Atta, Sheki, Jarrah, Hanjur, Hazmi, took cross-country surveillance flights early in the summer. There is another element that makes these images suspicious. In 2001, most security cameras functioned as time-lapse photography, recording an average of one frame per second. This video instead is a continuous recording, similar to those obtained with regular consumer-type camcorders. In any case, the fact remains that in 10 years, we have never seen a single image proving that the 19 alleged terrorists boarded the hijacked airplanes. To address this blatant oddity, the 9-11 Commission wrote that the security checkpoint in Newark, like the checkpoints in Boston, lacked closed-circuit television surveillance. But in a Los Angeles Times article dated September 13, 2001, Former FBI Assistant Director Louis Shaliro is quoted saying that FBI agents examined footage from dozens of cameras at the three airports where the terrorists boarded the aircraft. We also have the account by David Brent, a technical information engineer who worked for the company that had installed the security cameras at Dulles. After the 9-11 attacks, Brent stated, I was part of a team that had the laborious task of reviewing all the video from the airport. That's every frame from over 300 cameras with 30 days of retention time. The task took three weeks of 15-hour days. So where are the images of the terrorists? Even if the checkpoints from two of the three airports didn't have cameras, we should have dozens of images of the 19 terrorists standing in line for the check-in, getting their boarding passes, moving through the lounge areas, making phone calls, using stairs and conveyor belts, visiting the duty-free shops, or having a snack before departure. Each of these premises has also plenty of cameras of their own, which are used to keep an eye on their customers. And then we should have seen the terrorists seated in the departure lounges, waiting for the boarding call, and finally proceeding through the gates that would take them to the airplanes. But we have never seen any of this. Question, why were we never shown a single image of the 19 alleged hijackers moving through the different areas of the three airports on the morning of September 11? Since Washington Dulles did have security cameras at the checkpoints, why were we never shown the properly time-stamped images of the five terrorists boarding Flight 77 on the morning of September 11? Not only do we not have a single image of the 19 hijackers at the three airports on September 11, but we also don't have a single soundbite of their voices from the four cockpit voice recorders. With four hijackings that lasted between 18 and 41 minutes each, we should have some two hours of continuous recordings of what happened in the cockpits of the four airplanes. We should have heard the struggles of the terrorists storming in and overcoming the pilots, and then we should have heard their conversations in Arabic as they try to figure out where they are and how to get from there to their designated targets. But we never heard any of that. For American 11, the plane that hit the first tower, we were told that the cockpit voice recorder was never found. For United 175, the plane that hit the second tower, we were also told that the cockpit voice recorder was never found. For the flight that hit the Pentagon, we were told that the voice recorder was found, but it was damaged to the point that the contents were unusable. This is very curious, as black boxes are built specifically to withstand extremely high temperatures and the most violent of impacts. Planes have two so-called black boxes, actually painted orange to make them more visible. They're kept at the back of the plane. Two shells of stainless steel and a heat protective material shield the flight data recorder and the cockpit voice recorder. They can withstand pressure down to 6,000 meters and heat of 1,100 degrees centigrade. 
For United 93, the voice recorder was found, we were told, and was in good condition. But, for unknown reasons, the recording was never made public. In December 2001, members of the victims' families formally asked the FBI to release the voice recordings from the cockpit of Flight 93. But the FBI replied, While we empathize with the grieving families, we do not believe that the horror captured on the cockpit voice recording will console them in any way. At the end of the day, the only sound bites from the alleged hijackers we ever heard are a couple of clips recorded by air traffic controllers on the ground as the terrorists apparently punched the wrong keys talking to their passengers. Curiously, the hijacker from another flight made the exact same mistake. But these recordings could have been transmitted by anyone and from anywhere. They don't prove that the terrorists were actually aboard the planes. In fact, the opposite suspicion arises in this case, just as the Portland images seem to be the perfect substitute for the complete lack of images of the 19 terrorists at the three airports. These short sound bites, apparently generated by mistake, seem to be the perfect substitute for the complete lack of conversations from the four cockpit voice recorders. The situation becomes even more implausible if we look at the actual flight data recorders, the devices that store the technical information from the plane during the flight. For the two airplanes that hit the towers, again, we are told that the flight data recorders were never found. In the months following the destruction of the Twin Towers, every ounce of rubble that left Ground Zero was meticulously combed through in the effort to recover every possible human remain. Uh, that's when we decided the very least that we can do if we can't bring them home to their families alive, then we'll, we'll stick it out and bring them home to their families. There wasn't a piece of rubble that left that pit that wasn't gone over with a fine tooth comb. This practice went on until the end of the removal operations. The big pile that you see in the background there is what remains of one of the towers. The tractor basically comes in, takes a, a shovel full of it, and then he feathers it out across the field out there. The guys take rakes, and they rake through it. It's very tedious, but we found we find bones constantly. As if that weren't enough, the same search was repeated at the Fresh Kills landfill in New Jersey. Every single piece of debris, having already been combed through at ground zero, went through three more passes under the careful eyes of officers and agents of the FBI and the NYPD. Yet we are asked to believe that not one, but four bright orange, practically indestructible voice and data recorders eluded a search so meticulous that it was able to recover dozens of watches, banknotes, personal documents, and even buckets of coins. For the other two flights, the one that hit the Pentagon and the one that crashed in Pennsylvania, the flight data recorders were found, we were told, and were in good condition. It's from these two black boxes that the animations depicting the full flight of American 77 and United 93 were extracted. These two black boxes, however, pose a big problem. Every flight data recorder carries a metal plaque indicating the exact model and serial number of that device. This allows a flight data recorder to always be matched to the plane it was mounted on while providing some important technical information. As explained by the NTSB, the serial number is used to identify when a recorder manufacturer switched from a certain memory configuration to another. This information is necessary to perform the correct recovery of the data. In virtually every accident report filed by the NTSB in the last 20 years, both the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder's serial numbers are listed. But in the reports from Flight 77 and Flight 93, for some reason, they are not. An independent researcher has filed several Freedom of Information Act requests with the NTSB, the Federal Aviation Administration, and the FBI, requesting information on the missing serial numbers, but his requests were always denied. As no one has ever released the serial numbers of the two flight data recorders, it's impossible to know whether they came from Flight 77 and Flight 93, or from a totally different source. All in all, we have this paradoxical situation where the contents of six black boxes out of eight were never released, while the other two cannot be verified as genuine both in origin and content. As far as we know, the four airplanes that crashed on September 11 could have been totally different machines from those that left the airports earlier that morning. 
The obvious inability by these amateurs to fly the four airplanes in the way they were flown, and the total lack of proof that they were even aboard those planes, poses a serious question. If not them, then who was piloting the planes? One thing everyone can agree on is that no professional pilot in the world would ever crash his own plane into a highly populated target like the Pentagon or the Twin Towers in New York. Even at gunpoint, once he knew his plane was doomed, at the last minute he would steer it away from a populated target or plunge it directly into the sea. I don't believe any airline pilot would intentionally fly into the World Trade Center, even with a gun at his head. It is inconceivable to me that any airline pilot would allow anyone to force him to fly into an inhabited building. I cannot imagine how any pilot could be conscious or capable of doing anything to control that airplane at the time that it was directed at one of these buildings. But then, who was in the cockpits? What may seem as a far-fetched possibility was actually suggested by TV reporters less than 10 minutes after the impact on the second tower. That is a very large aircraft. It would be enormously uh, significant if someone was able in some way to get their hands on a 727 or a similar size commercial aircraft and then crash that in. Uh, Ollie? Jim, what you're saying uh, could, could be a drone aircraft. That's an aircraft that's uh, uh, guided electronically uh, to its target without having a pilot. Now that is a possibility as well. One fact that seems to support this possibility are the exceptional speeds these airplanes were able to achieve at low altitudes near sea level. As we know, a person can easily run at top speed through normal air, but he cannot do the same in a much thicker medium like water. If he were to be pushed at the same speeds in the thicker fluid, he would probably lose his arms and legs due to the excessive resistance he encounters. The same thing can happen to airplanes if they are pushed beyond their design structural limits. At 30,000 feet, the air is very thin, and the airplane can easily travel beyond 500 miles an hour without encountering much resistance. As soon as it starts descending, however, the atmosphere gets thicker and thicker, and the plane needs to reduce the speed accordingly in order to preserve its structural integrity. Below 10,000 feet in altitude, speeds around 250 miles per hour are recommended. In fact, each airplane has a specific maximum operating velocity, called VMO, which should never be exceeded at low altitudes. Never means never for a reason. Should the VMO be exceeded, a phenomenon called flutter can occur, which can quickly cause irreversible damage. The flutter phenomenon can affect any kind of airplane, from large military bombers to small single-engine airplanes. Once the VMO is exceeded, not only are the wings and the ailerons at risk, but also the fuselage begins suffering from the air pressure caused by the speed. This is what happened to an Air China 747, which exceeded the maximum operating speed, or VMO, in the desperate effort to recover from an engine failure. For the first time, Captain Ho takes manual control of the plane. Airspeed 270, 280. The plane is about to exceed its maximum speed. Approaching VMO. The stress of the dive tears the landing gear doors off the plane. Pass VMO. Emergency. Emergency. Luckily, the pilots were able to regain control of the plane and perform an emergency landing. The damage caused by the excess velocity was visible all over the plane. The maximum operating speed for a 767, two of the four hijacked airplanes, is 414 miles per hour. For the other two airplanes, the 757s, the VMO is even less, 402 miles per hour. Yet on 9-11, all four airplanes were flown at speeds close to or beyond 500 miles per hour near sea level without suffering any visible structural damage, while remaining perfectly under control all the way into their targets. American 11 hit high up in the North Tower around the 93rd floor, going a pretty astonishing rate of speed, almost 500 miles an hour. Here comes a very large target, descending rapidly, very fast. Diving very steeply and very fast. He's really moving. moving. He was moving fast. United Flight 175, streaking through the skies over New York at more than 600 miles an hour, barely missed colliding with another commercial flight. The back of my neck stands up when we talk about the hijacking. 
we, we watched the speed, very high rate of speed. I, I believe it was about 600 knots southbound, which was extremely unusual for an air carrier. According to the NTSB, during the descent from 12,000 to 6,000 feet, the aircraft ground speed remained between 500 and 520 knots. It then impacted World Trade Center Tower 2 at approximately 510 knots ground speed. 510 knots is 586 miles per hour. That's almost 200 miles per hour beyond the maximum operating velocity of a 767. American 77 also impressed the air traffic controllers for the speed in approaching Washington. It was an unidentified plane to the southwest of Dulles, moving at a very high rate of speed. I slid over to the controller on my left, and I asked him, do you see an unidentified plane there southwest of Dulles? And his response was, yes. Oh my gosh, yes. Look how fast he is. Full throttle. Full out. The plane made its circular descent at about 350 miles an hour. Then it kept accelerating until it crashed into the Pentagon, says the commission report, traveling at approximately 530 miles per hour. While flying at 5,000 feet of altitude, United 93 began performing a series of hard left and right maneuvers at 350 miles per hour. This was followed by a series of similar up and down maneuvers while flying near 400 miles per hour. Yet Zihad Jarad, the amateur who wasn't allowed to fly solo on a single engine airplane, braved the roller coaster without ever losing control. As the plane was descending, he even kept accelerating until the aircraft plowed into an empty field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania at 580 miles per hour. These exceptional speeds achieved at low altitudes have raised more than an eyebrow among aeronautical experts and pilots alike, especially those who had flown the actual airplanes involved in 9-11. I flew the two actual aircraft uh, which were involved in 9-11, the flight number 175 and flight 93, the 757 that allegedly went down at Shanksville, and flight 175 is the aircraft that's uh, alleged to have hit the South Tower. I don't believe it's possible for a terrorist, a so-called terrorist, to train on a 172 then jump in a cockpit of a 757-767 glass cockpit and vertical navigate the aircraft, lateral navigate the aircraft, and fly the airplane at speeds exceeding its design limit speed by well over 100 knots, make high speed, uh, high bank turns, uh, exceeding pulling po probably five, six, seven Gs, uh, and the aircraft would literally fall out of the sky. I couldn't do it, and I'm absolutely positive they couldn't do it. How do you feel about United 175 reaching 510 knots? Flight 175 that hit the second tower, they said it was going at uh, roughly 560 miles an hour at sea level. No, that's impossible. You need so much power to push yourself through that air. So the engines have the right amount of horsepower for cruising at 30,000 feet at 500 plus miles an hour. To do that at ground level, you need six times that amount of power. Those engines can't put out six times more power. If you changed up the motors so they had were motors that had six times the thrust then you know theoretically you could but then the structure is not strong enough. Under under all circumstances I'd say an absolute resounding no. It, uh, to me it's impossible. You know any pilot that has been in a commercial jet would probably laugh at uh, if you said 510 knots. Uh, is it possible to fly over 500 miles an hour at sea level? Uh, no. It would be above the indicated uh, airspeed would be uh, greater than at uh, its maximum speed at sea level. Um, even, like say if it was even in a, like a shallow type of dive, would it be able to... Any, any airplane can be dive, of course, then you've got the assistance of gravity, right? But there, there, there comes a point where there's a, the, the drag of the air overcomes the aerodynamics of the airplane. For a final word, the same researcher has called Boeing Corporation. Is It has to do with uh, the maximum speed of a 767-200 at 700 feet altitude. For 200? Uh, yeah, 767-200, yeah. Like I, I had asked some people and they, they assumed it would be about 250 miles an hour or something. That sounds pretty likely because uh, at 35,000 feet it's 530 miles. 
So there's no way that uh, it, it could be going 500 miles an hour at 700 feet altitude then? <laughs> Not a chance. Not that fast. Question. Can you produce any evidence that a Boeing 767 equipped with regular engines can fly for almost two minutes beyond 500 miles per hour in the lower strata of the atmosphere without suffering any visible structural damage? Can you explain how amateur pilots who had never flown a jet before in their life could maintain full control of an airliner that has exceeded the VMO by almost 200 miles per hour? And why would some terrorists, who have been lucky enough to get within reach of their target, want to risk the entire operation by imposing such a stress on the airplane that it would almost certainly cause them to crash before they complete their mission? One question becomes inevitable at this point. If those were military drones and not regular airliners, what happened to the passengers? With certainty, no one can answer this question. One thing we do know, however, the CIA has been developing plans for covert operations that involve the in-flight swapping of commercial airliners with military drones since the 1960s. One such plan was called Operation Northwoods, and it detailed how to replace a civil airliner with a military drone in mid-air, unbeknownst to the air traffic controllers. After the swap, the airliner would be landed in a military base, the drone would continue to fly, appearing on radar as the original plane, and would be remotely guided all the way into the target. We don't know whether this is the actual end the passengers met, but one thing we can say for sure, those who called their relatives from their cell phones could not have placed those calls from the airplanes in flight. Minutes after the fourth plane had crashed in Pennsylvania, news was already circulating that several passengers had made calls with their cell phones from the hijacked airplanes. We are being hijacked. We are being hijacked. Those frightening words were uttered by a passenger aboard United Flight 93 who was able to call emergency personnel on his cell phone before the plane crashed in western Pennsylvania. And tonight we're getting reports of cell phone calls from at least three of those four flights. On the second flight that came out of Boston, that was the second flight of the day, and also went into one of the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center, there was a businessman who got off two cell phone calls uh, to his father. The CNN commentator Barbara Olson, wife of U.S. Solicitor General Very Ted Olson. She reportedly called her husband twice on a mobile phone to tell him her plane was being hijacked. The problem is that in 2001, it was practically impossible to make a call with a cell phone from an airplane at cruising altitudes. The whole idea behind cellular phones is that they use low power transmitters, both to keep the cost of the units down and to preserve battery life. It is up to the receiving towers on the ground to pick up and boost their signal before they route it through the system. It is commonly thought that beyond 10,000 feet in altitude, most cell phones become useless. Passenger planes normally cruise at 30,000 feet and beyond. The editors of Popular Mechanics, however, maintain that cell phones do work from cruising airplanes, even at maximum altitudes. David Dunbar. With regard to the cell phones, we did what any reporter would do. We talked to experts in the field, and in fact, cell phones do work at that altitude, up to 35,000 feet and higher. And um, in 2001? Be, in 2001, and it might be instructive for you to talk to some of the cell phone experts. Instead of talking to experts, Japanese television decided to take matters into their own hands. In 2003, they conducted an on-camera experiment near Ontario, Canada to verify the actual reach of cell phones from different altitudes. The cellular phone system used in the experiment in Canada is the one used in the United States. Three cell phones, each from different telephone companies, were used. The experiment begins at a thousand feet. Hello? The results were the same with the other two. Next, we went up to 4,000 feet. Then, Company B's phone stopped working at 4,000 feet. And when the aircraft rose to 6,000 feet, Company A's phone also became useless. At 8,000 feet, none of the three cell phones worked anymore. No service on A, no service on B, no service on C. In other words, at an altitude of 35,000 feet, cell phones would have been totally useless. 
There is another problem besides altitude that makes calling from a cell phone unthinkable from a cruising airplane, and that is speed. Calling from an aircraft with a cell phone would be like calling from a car traveling at 500 miles per hour. The connection would continuously need to be transferred from one receiving station to the next, and then to the next, and again to the next. The transfer procedure between two receiving stations is called handoff, and it relies on continuous triangulations between the receiving towers in order to establish the exact position of the caller. As the mobile unit approaches the handoff zone, the first tower senses the weakening of the signal and prepares to transfer the call to the second. When the second tower senses the signal is strong enough to take over, the handoff procedure is initiated. If everything goes well, the call is rerouted into the system by the new receiving station. But the speed by which an airplane approaches and crosses over the handoff zone is so high that the towers wouldn't have the time to complete the handoff procedure. The call would be dropped and the person would need to dial the number from scratch. If one considers the altitude and the speed problems combined, it should be clear that the chances of having an actual conversation with a cell phone from a cruising airplane are practically nil. Even after 2001, both altitude and speed problems remain. In 2005, the Washington Post wrote, most cell phones can't reach a station from beyond 10,000 feet. Another technical hurdle is to find a way that cell phone calls would be handed off from one cell tower to another on the ground when an aircraft is traveling at 500 miles an hour. And even 10 years after 9-11, people who try to use their cell phone from cruising altitudes are bound to get the same results. Once it became clear that the passengers could not have placed their calls from the cell phones on the airplanes, the official narrative on this issue became more and more ambiguous and non-committal. Theodore Olson, who had initially told the press he had received two cell phone calls from his wife Barbara, changed his story to calls made from an air phone. And by the time the 9-11 Commission published their final report, only one mention on the cell phone calls remained. Shortly thereafter, wrote the commission, passengers and flight crew began a series of calls from GTA air phones and cellular phones. No indication on which calls were made from cell phones and which ones with air phones was given. The authorities from the Masawi trial also avoided being too specific on the origin of the calls. Within the official documentation, they released this flash animation, which contains all the basic information on the four hijacked airplanes. By clicking on any of the flights, one can view the passengers list. By clicking on the telephone icon at the bottom, the passengers who have made phone calls are highlighted. And by clicking on any of the passengers' names, the list of the calls they have made is displayed. Each of the calls lists the exact time it was placed, the duration, the initial part of the number dialed, and the name of the person receiving the call. But the number from which the phone call was placed is missing. The only information available is the location on the plane the calls were presumably made from, row 30 in this case. It's as if the authorities were trying to suggest that the calls were made from air phones without having to put it down on paper. Only in two cases did the authorities openly state that a cell phone was used. One is the call allegedly placed to 911 by a passenger who had locked himself in a lavatory where air phones are not available. The second is a call placed by flight attendant C.C. Lyles to her husband, who later described his surprise in receiving a call from her cell phone in a television interview. Once the phone got disconnected, then I sat up in the bed like, it was like I just woke up. I'm like, did, was that a real call? So I looked at the caller ID and noticed that it was a call and it was from her cell phone. And I'm like, okay, wait a minute. How, how can she call me from on the plane? from a cell phone because cell phones don't work on a plane. That's what I'm thinking. As only these two phone calls were admitted by the authorities, the debunkers have universally adopted the only two cell phone calls made position. The telefonate non sono state fatte con il cellulare. Sono state fatte con gli airphone. In soli due casi è stato usato un cellulare. Quindi quelle due telefonate brevissime, frammentarie, sono state fatte quando l'aereo era una quota perfettamente compatibile con la rete cellulare americana. But one thing is the number of cell phone calls admitted to. Another is the number of calls that were actually made. In the days following 9-11, the FBI interviewed the various people who had received a phone call from their relatives on the planes. And their reports tell a different story. One of the reports reads, starting at approximately 6.30 Pacific Standard Time, which is 9.30 New York time, Dina Burnett received a series from three to five cellular phone calls from her husband, Thomas Burnett. 
Burnett was able to determine her husband was using his own cellular phone because the caller ID showed his number. Only one of the calls did not show the caller ID as she was on the line with another call. According to the official documentation, Thomas Burnett made a total of three calls, one at 9.30, one at 9.37, and one at 9.44. This means that at least two of these calls, if not all three, were made from Burnett's cellular phone. At 9.30, the plane was flying at 32,000 feet and climbing. At 9.37, it had reached 36,000 feet and was still climbing. At 9.44, it had descended to 22,000 feet, while it accelerated until reaching a ground speed of almost 400 miles per hour. None of these calls seems to have been possible with a cell phone from that airplane. According to another report, United 93 passenger Jeremy Glick saw hijackers on the plane, used a cell phone, and called Makeley, his stepmother, to report the hijacking. He then asked to talk to his wife, Lisbeth. And, uh, and he was on the phone and he had told me um, that his plane had been hijacked. According to the FBI, Glick's wife, Lisbeth, could not hear any unusual sounds in the background of the call, and the connection was extremely clear, as if he was calling from the next room. Cell phone communication was lost at 9.55. Glick placed the call at 9.37, which means the communication lasted uninterrupted for 18 minutes while the plane was flying between 39,000 and 10,000 feet at an average speed of almost 400 miles per hour. Only a miracle could have kept that connection open for all that time had the call truly been placed from the airplane in flight. Lauren Grancolas possessed a cellular phone and is believed to have allowed another passenger, Honor Wainio, to use the cellular phone. Wainio placed one call to her parents at 9.53, when the plane was at about 10,000 feet, traveling close to 400 miles per hour. Elsa Strong received a cell phone call from her sister, Lisa Gronland, a passenger on United 93. Gronland made the call to her sister at 9.46, when the plane was at 17,000 feet and traveling at almost 400 miles per hour. Marion Britton was also a passenger on United 93. Britton's live-in boyfriend received a cellular phone call from Britton during the hijacking. Britton told Fiamano, her boyfriend, that she had borrowed a cell phone from another passenger. Britain's call to Fiumano took place at 9.49, when United 93 was flying beyond 13,000 feet at a speed of 420 miles per hour. Peter Hansen, a passenger on United 175, contacted his mother on cell phone and said the flight had been hijacked. Peter's father, Lee, said that he resisted the temptation to call his son back because he didn't want to place him in more danger by having his cell phone ring on the plane. Peter Hansen called his parents twice, at 8.52 and at 9 a.m. At 8.52, the plane was at 30,000 feet and it was climbing. At 9 o'clock, it was flying at over 18,000 feet in altitude, while it accelerated towards the record-breaking speed of almost 600 miles per hour near sea level. Brian Sweeney was also a passenger on United 175. After learning of the attacks, wrote the FBI, his wife Julie Sweeney returned home to find that her husband had left a message made from his cell phone aboard the plane on their answering machine. Sweeney made the call at 8.58 in between the two Hansen calls when the plane was still at 25,000 feet in altitude. While any one of these phone calls could have momentarily been connected by a set of fortunate coincidences, it should be obvious that all these cell phone calls as a whole could not have been made from the cruising airplanes. Question. Given the known limitations of the cellular phone system in 2001, can you provide any evidence that the cell phone calls made by the passengers reported by the FBI could have been made from the altitudes, at the speeds, and for the durations indicated for each of them? We do know, however, that the calls were made, as no one has ever doubted that the relatives actually received them. This opens the way to a disturbing possibility, which seems to support the in-flight swap hypothesis, that the passengers were forced to call their relatives under duress, pretending to be on the airplane, while in fact they had already been landed in some unknown location. In support of this hypothesis, we have different elements. One is the conversation passenger Todd Beamer had with a GTA airphone operator, Lisa Jefferson, during the hijack of Flight 93. It is through Lisa Jefferson that the whole world learned about the famous call to action, let's roll. When he told the guys, are you ready? I assumed that they were waiting on his cue. Then they responded to him and he said, okay, let's roll. 
The 9-11 Commission has established that the hijack took place at 9.28. Todd Beamer was connected to Lisa Jefferson at 9.43, some 15 minutes into the hijacking. The FBI report confirms that Jefferson received the call from Beamer at approximately 8.45 Central Time, which is 9.45 Eastern. But the contents of the conversation are strikingly at odds with the official narrative. According to Jefferson, Beamer called to state that the plane was about to be hijacked. He stated that three individuals, two wielding knives, the third with a bomb strapped to his waist with a red belt, were preparing to take control of the flight. Jefferson estimated that she spoke to Beamer for seven minutes before the two hijackers armed with knives entered the cockpit. This places the hijacking at around 9.52, while officially it took place at 9.28. This is no small discrepancy. How could Beamer be describing events that are supposed to be happening in front of his eyes when in fact they had already happened half an hour before? How could the terrorists be preparing to take control of the flight at 9.45 when they had already been in the cockpit for more than 15 minutes? The FBI also wrote that Jefferson noted that the call had an unusually low amount of background noise, the same thing Liz Glick had noticed. Furthermore, the records show that Beamer's call lasted roughly one hour and that the line was left open after the crash. We didn't lose a connection, stated Jefferson, because there's a different sound that you use. I never lost connection. It just went silent. Jefferson stayed on the phone, stated the FBI, until she learned Flight 93 had crashed. Question. Since airphones are powered by the same airplane's electrical system, how could the line have remained open for another 45 minutes after the plane had literally disintegrated to the ground in a thousand pieces? All these discrepancies seem to suggest that Beamer was not on the plane, observing real events unfolding, but was describing an imaginary, prescripted situation from a different location. In support of this hypothesis, we also have the dramatic message left by flight attendant Cece Lyles in her husband's answering machine before briefly talking to him on her cell phone. As she herself is suggesting, we should listen very carefully. Tuesday, 9.47 a.m. Hi, baby. I'm, baby, you have to listen to me carefully. I'm on a plane that's been hijacked. I'm on the plane. I'm calling from the plane. I want to tell you I love you. Please tell my children that... We, too, can notice the absence of the typical background noise heard inside a plane. I don't know what to say. There's three guys. They've hijacked the plane. I'm trying to be calm. We're After saying goodbye, she seems to fumble with the headset while she whispers a few more words into the mouthpiece. I hope to be able to see your face again, baby. I love you. Even by playing the segment several times, it remains difficult to hear anything different from the words, it's a frame. In any case, the problem with the phone calls does not change. The cell phone calls confirmed by the FBI in their reports cannot have been made from the cruising airplanes. Someone has to explain where they came from.